May 11th, Daily Video Bible Reading from the Net Bible, Acts chapter 21 of the New Testament. After we tore ourselves away from them, we put out to sea, and sailing a straight course, we came to cause. On the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patera, we found a ship crossing over to Phoenicia, went aboard and put out to sea. After we sighted Cyprus and left it behind on our port side, we sailed on to Syria and put in at Tyre, because the ship was to unload its cargo there. After we located the disciples, we stayed there seven days. They repeatedly told Paul, through the Spirit, not to set foot in Jerusalem. When our time was over, we left and went on our way. All of them, with their wives and children, accompanied us outside of the city. After kneeling down on the beach and praying, we said farewell to one another. Then we went aboard the ship and they returned to their own homes. We continued the voyage from Tyre and arrived at Ptolemus, and when we had greeted the brothers, we stayed with them for one day. On the next day we left and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. While we remained there for a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. He came to us, took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it, and said, The Holy Spirit says this, This is the way the Jews in Jerusalem will tie up the man whose belt this is, and will hand him over to the Gentiles. When we heard this, both we and the local people begged him not to go to Jerusalem. Then Paul replied, what are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be tied up, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Because he could not be persuaded, we said no more, except the Lord's will be done. After these days, we got ready and started up to Jerusalem. Some of the disciples from Caesarea came along with us too and brought us to the house of Mason of Cyprus, a disciple from the earliest times with whom we were to stay. When we arrived in Jerusalem, the brothers welcomed us gladly. The next day Paul went in with us to see James and all the elders were there. When Paul had greeted them, he began to explain in detail what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. When they heard this, they praised God. Then they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands of Jews there were who have believed and they are all ardent observers of the law. They have been informed about you that you teach all the Jews now living among the Gentiles to abandon Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or live according to our customs. What then should we do? They will no doubt hear that you have come. So do what we tell you. We have four men who have taken a vow. Take them and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so that they may have their heads shaved. Then everyone will know there is nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself live in conformity with the law. But regarding the Gentiles who have believed, we have written a letter, having decided that they should avoid meat that has been sacrificed to idols and blood, and what has been strangled, and sexual immorality. Then Paul took the men the next day, and after he had purified himself along with them, he went to the temple and gave notice of the completion of the days of purification, when the sacrifice would be offered for each of them. When the seven days were almost over, the Jews from the province of Asia, who had seen him in the temple area, stirred up the whole crowd and seized him, shouting, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who teaches everyone, everywhere, against our people, our law, and the sanctuary. Furthermore, he has brought Greeks into the inner courts of the temple and made this holy place ritually unclean. For they had seen Trophimus, the Ephesian in the city, with him previously, and they assumed Paul had brought him into the inner temple courts. The whole city was stirred up, and the people rushed together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple courts, and immediately the doors were shut. While they were trying to kill him, a report was sent up to the commanding officer of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. 
He immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down to the crowd. When they saw the commanding officer and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the commanding officer came up and arrested him and ordered him to be tied up with two chains. He then asked who he was and what he had done. But some in the crowd shouted one thing and others something else. And when the commanding officer was unable to find out the truth because of the disturbance, he ordered Paul to be brought into the barracks. When he came to the steps, Paul had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. For a crowd of people followed them, screaming away with him. As Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the commanding officer, May I say something to you? The officer replied, Do you know Greek? Then you're not the Egyptian who started a rebellion and led the 4,000 men of the assassins into the wilderness some time ago. Paul answered, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of an important city. Please allow me to speak to the people. When the commanding officer had given him permission, Paul stood on the steps and gestured to the people with his hand. When they had become silent, he addressed them in Aramaic. God, I, I empathize with the disciples, the disciples who told Paul that the Holy Spirit had told them for him not to go to Jerusalem. Paul's like, are you joking me? I'm supposed to go to Jerusalem. How can you say that? But I do have empathy for them in the sense that I'm sure they thought they heard something from the Holy Spirit and maybe they did hear something. But we are human beings with emotions and those disciples loved Paul. Of course they wouldn't want him to go to Jerusalem. Of course they wouldn't want him to go into something that potentially is going to get him killed. But I think about that humanness that we have and how it can stop us or stop others from having the kind of relationship with you that they deserve. More importantly, that you deserve. I think about, especially uh, girls that I do counseling with, that they're involved with with men and their heart emotionally is involved in these relationships yet they tell me things like well I got him to go to church and now he's reading his Bible and sometimes I think we mix, mix up the messages of what you've told us to do in those relationships maybe we were only supposed to get him to church or only get him to read his Bible we weren't supposed to become emotionally involved in that situation. Or when we have a friend who we can see is just headed down the wrong path and instead of really truly listening to the plan you have for his or her life, God, we interject some of our own quote unquote wisdom into it out of the goodness of our heart. And it truly is out of the goodness of our heart. We just love them to death, but we have got to remember in those situations you know better than we do. You know the whole game plan. You know where you want them to go and what you want them to do. God, just help us, especially in these emotionally invested situations that all of us are in, that we take time to not only turn it over to you and ask what your will is, but we truly, purely listen to what your answer is, even if it's something that we don't like. That we go with what you have told us, not our emotions. In your son's name I pray. Amen.